The Personal Connection. The Personal Connection. The Personal Connection. The Personal Connection Podcast. The show where we explore the importance of the personal connection and how this translates into business. Discussing the topic with leading professionals to help you unlock the reach your company can have. The Personal Connection Podcast, brought to you by Motivi. One chance to interrupt, make it count. Imagery that instantly connects. Welcome back to the Personal Connection Podcast. I'm delighted today to be joined by Amanda Jackson of Beacon Learning and Performance. And we're going to be exploring all things mental health, mental health, wellness, and looking after you. There's only one of you, so you've got to make sure you look after you. Now, we started this whole series on the podcast uh, a couple of weeks ago with Tracy, and we want to really deep dive into things today and everything from corporate mental health right the way through to looking after yourself and knowing how to help both yourself and others. So, Amanda, welcome, first of all, to the podcast, and let's see where the hell this conversation is going to lead us. It's uh, I'm sure we're going to explore all sorts of different topics and uh, leave the, the listener with valuable tips that they can take away. Fantastic. No, thank you very much for inviting me on it. Not a problem, mate. Not a problem. So, mental health, mental illness, mental wellness. <clears throat> so many terms get thrown around. What do we need to know? What do we need to understand? And how can we basically be, be better people at, at helping others? Okay, that's a great question. Um, I think you'll agree, people are talking about mental health now more than ever. Um, we're seeing it on different social media platforms, we're seeing it in the news, we're seeing it in on the television, and I think it's really important. Um, the one thing we need to be really careful about, though, is are we talking about it at a superficial level? Are we just paying it lip service? And that's my concern a little bit at the moment um, with the amount of people that are sort of talking about it, but are they really understanding what they're talking about? Um, so, yeah, the different terms. I often hear people talking about the fact that, oh, I think I've got mental health at the moment, or I'm worried about that person. I think they've got mental health. And it always, or part of it makes me smile because I realise they don't understand the term and part of me makes me want to cry a little bit inside because they don't understand the term. Um, so if I say to you that if I went to the doctors and said, oh, yeah, the doctors told me what's wrong with me, I've got blood pressure. Well, I'd hope so because without that, you'd be dead. But um, yeah, it, it doesn't help you, does it? That's the point. It's... No, that's it. it, it blood pressure, we've all got blood pressure, so you would never use that term. Whereas... When we think about mental health, we use that term like that, that someone's got mental health. We all have mental health um, and we need to understand actually how we can talk about mental health in a positive way, not just in how it seems to be at the moment, in a negative way when someone's concerned about poor mental health. Totally. And I mean, you said it straight away at the start, you know, we are starting to talk about it a lot more, you know, as something as... I think as a British nation, we've been quite bad at, and it's taken us a long time. It's that, you know, stiff upper lip and man up and all these sort of, all this crap um, that doesn't help anyone where, you know, over the pond, you know, in the States, they've been a lot better at exploring it uh, over the years. But it's something that we, we do need to put more time and more effort into and better messaging, I think. You know, it's, there was a whole thing, you know, it started last year of, there was a lot more in the media. But as you say, is it the right message that's getting out there? Because there's still so much confusion about, what is mental health? And you know, we were talking earlier and it's the same as any other fitness, isn't it? It's mental health. We've all got it. And it's just about different practices and, and how, you, how you actually improve yourself, I guess, in a way, rather than it being a problem. Yeah, I, I like to think of it as mental fitness. Um, and actually, if we think about um, and compare it with physical health, we understand that if we want to try and run 10K, we can't just go and run 10K or very few of us could just get out of bed and decide, oh, I'm going to go run 10K. You need to, you need to practice and you need to um, train to actually be able to get to where you want to be. And if once you achieve being able to run 10K, if you don't then continue to train, then actually your fitness is going to slip and you're going to not be able to do what you want to do. And if we think about that in the terms of mental fitness, um, and if we want to be at the top of our game, want to be as um, productive as we can be at work and at home and we want to feel the person we want to you know, be able to feel, then actually we need to work on our um, mental fitness as well. So thinking about actually days that we feel great, that, that's brilliant. 
but actually how can we try and get more of those days um, and create that, that resilience because we have life is, is full of ups and downs of course it is and that's make, what makes it interesting um, but we need to be able to be in a strong position to be able to cope with the downs um, and get ourselves sort of back up to where we want to be. Yeah, totally. And I think if we carry on on that whole like physical fitness sort of analogy as well, it's that same thing that, okay, you've got a little twinge because you've started running, but you know how to stretch it out because you've been to a physio and you've been given those skills. But without those skills, the problem will just get worse and you'll stop doing what you're doing. And then because you're not running, you'll put on weight and everything else. And suddenly you're in sort of a downward spiral um, because you're not doing anything about it. And it's exactly the same with mental health, isn't it? And, and mental fitness. You've, you've got to, you've got to ask for the help and know how to, how to be on top of things, really. Uh, it's, it's something that takes, yeah. it's not an, an overnight switch, is it? It's not something that you, I could walk into you and say, right, I've got X, Y, and Z going on. And you'd be like, right, okay, this, that's it. It's, it doesn't work that way, does it? No, absolutely. And, and I think that it's got to start with ourselves. It's got to start with actually understanding what our triggers are, understanding what we've got going on for us. Um, you know, and I know you talked about stress in, in, a, um, in, in a different podcast and I think, you know, with Tracy and I, and I think, you know, stress is a really interesting one because when you think about all the different stressors that are coming at you, they affect you differently to other people. So one one thing that might affect you might not affect somebody else. And there's a whole judgment then piece around it, which builds up that stress of, I oh, should I be feeling like this? Should I not? What will other people think? And it just adds to that spiral. But we've got to think about actually what are our triggers? What, what causes us to feel different things? Um, and I think we've got to be better at feeling what we feel and understanding that it's okay to feel happy. It's okay to feel sad. It's okay to want to shout and scream. It's okay to, you know, feel the different things that we feel because if we try and suppress them, if we try and think that we shouldn't be feeling these way, this sort of way because of whatever the reason is, then it, it's just that pressure cooker of emotions and it's going to come out. It's going to come out eventually. Um, so, yeah, I, I think a lot of it starts with us, with self and really trying to be more self-aware. Absolutely. And being selfless as well, isn't it? It's allowing, you know, giving yourself time and allowing yourself not to be perfect because we're not perfect. You know, we all have little things going on or big things going on and there's nothing wrong with that. And we just need to, yeah, say this is going on or this is how I'm feeling or whether you think it's right or not, if you're feeling it, if you're in that mindset or that zone, whatever, just talk about it. You know, there's no, there shouldn't be a stigma attached to it. We shouldn't be made to feel that we've got to be behave in a certain way. No, well, that's right. And again, if we take it away from the term mental health, where a lot of people think of that as being a negative connotation of, as in mental illness, if we try and take it away from that and we think of mental health as in terms of mental fitness, if you didn't go to the gym or, you know, if you could run, you know, run as all, I use runners as a great analogy because every runner has days where they can run brilliantly and some days where they just don't feel it. And actually normally they can run 10 K and after three or four, they just don't feel like they can, that they can do what they normally can do. And so sometimes you just don't feel yourself and that's absolutely fine. Um, and you would say that to somebody, you wouldn't have any you know, reservations saying, Oh yeah, I just didn't do my run properly today. I just didn't feel it. Whereas we seem to have a problem with mental health and talking about our mental fitness and saying some days, you know what, I just don't feel it. I just can't do what I would normally do because I just don't feel right. Because people worry that, oh, you're slipping into a mental illness, you're slipping into needing medication or counselling, or which is there's nothing wrong with any of those things if that's what you need. But a lot of people don't. A lot of people actually, if they start talking about their emotions, being open and honest around people that they work with or live with and build that support network, then actually just getting it out there can make people feel so much better. Absolutely. And it is that point that, you know, just opening up and being honest, um, first with yourself, isn't it? That's, that's the biggest thing of being like, okay, yeah, it's, it's okay to not feel perfect. As you say, I mean, you going on about running then that makes me smile because this time last year I was climbing up a mountain um, and you've got people who 
I you know did a lot of running as my training to to get my backside fit enough to to get get up there really. Um, but everyone had tough days, but we helped each other and talk through it because I guess it was just on a, a personal social level and we couldn't hide. You know, you couldn't hide the fact that you're having a crap day or you were feeling down or you you're struggling at that point of the the hike. We had to help each other and host, we had such a tumultuous time with with the trip because the the guy who's the linchpin of our group there was eight of us who went out there badly injured his ankle on the morning of day three of an eight day trek and we almost didn't think he was going to make it and so then suddenly rather than being the linchpin that was driving everyone and carrying everyone he was the one that needed the help and support and you know it took us on the rest of us then to both help and support him but then also help and support each other as well but we don't do that easily in the corporate workplace. You know, you've said that people start worrying that oh, it's going down an illness or everything else. And I guess there's that fear with people when, you know, they're talking or they, they know that there's something going on. They don't want to bring it up in the workplace because they don't want this stigma attached to them or, or anything else. And that's that sort of worry that, as you say, the boss is going to be thinking, right, okay, so they're going to be a problem where it's not a problem. It's just something that needs managing and dealing with. It's, it's the same as having a bad back, isn't it? You know, it's, you can solve it. Absolutely. We all, we put ourselves in these internal competitions with everybody else around us, but yet nobody knows they're in that competition with you. So you look around and say, Oh, you know, why is that person saying that they, they don't, you know, they've got it easy. Or you might, you might say, Oh, I can't tell that person something to, to that particular person because they won't understand they've got it worse than me. We put ourselves in these competitions all the time and we, in, and we second guess what other people are going to think and do in, in our heads. When actually, when you do start talking about how you're feeling, you'll be surprised at how many people go, Oh my God, I feel the same. Or, you know what? My, my sister feels like that. I, I was talking to her the other day or my, my best friend saying that, or my partner saying this, the amount of people that you'll suddenly find, you know, are going through so much stuff at the moment. And that's my favorite word stuff, because it just depends on individuals, yeah, yeah, yeah. but people are going through that much stuff that, you know, and, and it, and it tugs at them in different ways. Uh, and, you know, especially, especially going through what we're going through right now. Um, you know, with COVID, it's, it's the, the amount of different stresses everyone's got and we're putting ourselves in this internal competition. And it is, it's, it's a case of, you know, you mentioned the fact, you know, what, what will my manager say? Your manager's probably going through a different set of crap that they are feeling probably the same way, you know, because we're all feeling different ways, you know, and we need to, as you say, when someone's having a good day to celebrate that and they can then help support you and bring you up rather than thinking, I better not tell anybody I'm having a good day because they may think, oh, great, you know, I'm not. Or, you know, the other way around, we put, we try and second guess what people are going to say all the time and we need to stop doing it. Totally. I mean, you mentioned in the situation that we're in at the moment and, you know, as you say, talking to people and when you've got things going on, I, I think in a normal office environment, you know, you'll chat to someone over making a cup of coffee or over your lunch break or something. But because everyone or so many people have become isolated this year and whether they're still stuck working from home or, or whatever, it's, it's really tough, isn't it? Because people aren't having that conversation. And I think there's going to be, certainly I've seen it you know, with some people and I think there's going to be a lot more of it, that there are going to be more mental health issues developing because people are sort of stuck and lost and where the hell do you turn? And do people, do, do employers even know that their workforce has got a problem? Yeah, that's, that's the other side of it. It's interesting and, and I completely agree with what you say, but just to, just to put another spin on it, yes, you can talk over the water cooler, you can talk in, you know, at the beginning or after meetings, but actually those conversations when you're actually with people are, are people being honest? You know, when you say, oh, you know, how are you? Oh, I'm great, thank you. And they're putting this smile on. Actually, have they been? Okay. Now we're going through, you know, this pandemic where it is affecting everybody. Actually, if we can embrace the fact that we know that everyone's going through tough stuff at the moment and it's almost giving people permission to say, hang on, I'm struggling. And if we can use this as a positive and actually get people to start reaching out in a safe way that it's okay to be feeling rubbish, we're in a pandemic and actually get that ball rolling. So we start using this language more of an everyday term. 
you know, checking how we're feeling. Oh, are we having a great day today? Or actually, are we not feeling so good? What can we do to help support you? What can you do to support yourself? And we can start getting that more habitually when we are through this pandemic, whenever that may be, and we start returning to more of a normal life, again, whatever normal looks like for you. This language hopefully is then more in our vocabulary because before people were still feeling, you know, all sorts of ways and they weren't admitting to it because they didn't feel like they they were allowed to because everybody else in the corporate world was stiff, like stiff up a lip and carrying on being professional doing all that sort of stuff that you were talking about but actually now if we can this pandemic's given us um Palmer's permission to say and put their hand up and say, you know what, I'm struggling because of X, Y, and Z. And if we can start trying to use that now in a positive way and really reach out and start getting that language in our normal vocabulary, actually that might be a good thing. Does that make sense? I don't know. (laughs) Absolutely. Absolutely it does. And I'm just standing here thinking, I so hope that is the case. There are so many things that have happened this year that if we could all step back and realize they're massive positives. You know, we, we all started taking more time with our families because we were forced to, but then we started doing things and yeah, you were seeing, I loved it. We were walking the dog and you seen families out together and being normal rather than stuck to a device all the time or rushing from A to B with, you know, work pressures and school pressures and college pressure, whatever. And it was taking that little bit of extra time. But I think a lot of that's already slipped. And it's such a damn shame because there are so many things we could take from this year. I mean, I'm certainly taking the whole fact that I've loved having more time and having that little bit more control over time. And it's like, you know what, I'm, I need to keep this next year. It's, there's no doubt about it because I've felt so much better in myself and, and happier at home. Uh, it's, uh, the wife's been less likely to kill me. So it's, uh, it's got to be a good thing. But yeah, as you say, maybe if we can know the fact that we're all going through problems and we are all struggling in our, our own way. I mean, I know in, in my industry, you know, with photography, there are so many guys, in, especially in the events and the wedding sector, who are literally still dying on the backsides because there's just no support and there's no end in sight either. But we're all going through it. So I think everyone's is talking about it a bit more. And I would love for us to, as a nation, to to embrace that sort of change that we've all got now um, and put it into our vocab because it's okay to not be okay. That's, that's the point, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. It is. It's, it's so, so important. Um, and, you know, we, we, we talked about, and you mentioned at the very beginning sort of the mental health first aid and, and, and that's great. And there's a huge place for it for, you know, for workplaces to have mental health first aid in the workplace but it's not a magic pill. It's not, it's not a magic bullet. It's not, you know, it's not going to solve the problems. It's got to start with understanding ourselves and it's got to start with actually us talking with people that we feel safe to talk to, to start with, but just trying to work out that vocabulary that we feel comfortable saying, but actually just start talking and actually just be more aware of, as I said before, our triggers, what, you know, what, what's, what's causing us to be feeling happy at the moment? Because as you say, you know, yeah, and, and there's been so, so much stuff that's going on, you know, and we, bad stuff that's going on because of the, um, of the pandemic. And, you know, and I'm not trying to um, undermine, you know, all that stuff that's going on, but there has been some positives. There has been, and you, you've just mentioned some of them as well. And I think it's taking stock and writing some of that down and reflecting on some of the things that you really enjoyed doing that you maybe were forced to do to start with, but then became habitual and you you started to enjoy doing it so they don't slip because it is so easy to get stuck back into the mundane routines. And because we've always done it, then we just get back on and do it. But actually starting to challenge the status quo and actually say, well, actually, you know, I, I really enjoyed doing this task why can't I go back to doing it? So, yeah, I think it is. It's challenging, challenging the status quo. It's reflecting on all the positives that have happened. And for a lot of people that have been positives, I know not for everybody, um, and really reflecting on that. Totally, totally. And yeah, just let's, let's use this whole thing as a, as a period for change. And you say about writing stuff down, that was something that we, 
we covered in the last uh, interview with Tracy, where it was, you know, the idea of journaling and diaries and just get stuff out of your head. But it can be positive things as well as negative things, can't it? It's like, put stupid post-it notes up that are going to take you back to something and make you smile and give you that bit of energy, that bit of invigoration to, to do something. It's, yeah, yeah celebrate the, the little wins in life as well, you know? Absolutely. We've, we've started um, having the, uh, the, Jackson, the Jackson Awards every, every dinner time. So we, we now, because we're not having to commute, we, we sit and eat with the kids. Um, I've got two children, so me and my husband sit with the kids and we eat together most nights now, um, which is wonderful. And that's a positive change for us. Um, so we had the Jackson Awards. So every night we say, is there any awards you want to give out to each other? And, and it just makes people... Us all appreciate just some little things and we don't all have to give out awards we don't all get them you know it's not a, a forced thing um but most most evenings my um eight-year-old son always thanks daddy for cooking dinner because my husband cooks dinner most nights um and for our delicious food um, and it always makes us laugh because he does it every time and then he always reminds us no i don't always do it on a sunday because i don't like sunday dinners so it makes us realize that actually he's doing it because he does enjoy the food and he appreciates it not just because he's doing it just for, you know for the sake of it but then we think about just little things that we've done that's made us smile or been kind to each other. And it just makes us stop and reflect. Um, and now if I forget to do it, my five-year-old says, Mummy, we've not done the Jackson Awards. And I'm like, oh, sorry, come on then. I hope you got one. And, and it's just, it, you know, it's just a nice little thing that just makes us stop. And it's quite habitual now. We've started doing it. And it's nothing, we don't have to write anything down. We don't, but it just makes us reflect on just little things that we've done during the day that we appreciate in each other. And, it, and it's just something that's just quite a nice thing to do appreciation what a word it's um and just appreciating each other all the way through so i mean let's spin this around let's go back all the way to the start on the corporate side of things because you come from a corporate background so the corporate challenges around taking time to properly give a damn about mental you know mental health uh, mental you know awareness wellness looking after the staff a lot of them i guess will be like right we've got to do something box ticking exercise let's get someone in give a training course boom we're done we can forget about it for another year what can they actually do you know, from from that corporate background what's what are the biggest things that employers can do to to help look after their staff um i think the, i guess the biggest one is modeling behavior actually you know and i'm not saying that you know all MDs or all managers have got to suddenly start like laying themselves out bare and saying all their problems and struggles in the world. And I'm not saying that, but but actually modeling behavior as far as if they're having having a day where they're feeling quite stressed out or appreciating the fact that work is really tough at the moment, then saying it and just getting people to understand that, you know, you are all in the same boat as far as, um, the stresses and strains that they've got and the appreciation that people are trying to still juggle kids and work and, you know, sitting on your sofa with your laptop or because you can't be in the office at the moment, you know, just, you know, the, the, the biggest, one of the biggest thing is recognition and modeling behavior because that can start changing the culture of an organization. Um, and, you know, you mentioned the tick box exercise and there's absolutely no point in getting somebody trained um, as a mental health first aider in one person in the workplace and like they're a lone wolf walking around the organization and, and it's just not going to work and it's it's just not effective so yeah so it's trying to change that culture by having mental health first aiders in the workplace it does not only does the, the mental health first aiders learn so much on the course but actually it shows the rest of the organization that the company care about mental health see it as a priority and are investing time and money in skills within the workforce, um, within the, the employers and um, employees. And I think it's that in itself speaks volumes. Um, but yeah, there needs to be policies, there needs to be, you know, um, employee assistance programs, there needs to be other things in the background that go with it. You know, mental health first aid isn't a silver bullet isn't that that thing that's going to suddenly turn it all round. It can certainly support people um, and can certainly help. Um, but yeah, it, it's not. It, it's not. It can't just be coming in as a as that tick box exercise and and away we go. No, absolutely. I think as well, especially because with everything within our minds, 
we let things build up, don't we? And so we need to deal with them in a, a different way to like a physical problem. So, you know, you've got your, your normal first aiders and they can treat you if you've fallen over. They know what to do if, you know, you go into shock or whatever else because they've gone through it. They've done the, the resource, the any training, whatever else. But that's sort of like a quick win and then the ambulance service is going to come in. They know what to do. But saying about the ambulance service, they're not mentally mental health trained and there's not that understanding and so even there there's there's a massive skills gap and a massive resource gap as well i think and that's something as a as a country we need to be better at um yeah, it's just to realize that we need to help people and you yeah, know jump in there and, and see what we can do and it's yeah leading courses is is great and it, it does raise awareness and shows that as a company that you care but it's keeping those communication channels open as well, isn't it? That's, I think, the biggest thing. Communication is key. And if you can change the, the workplace into a culture that it's okay to not be okay, and, you know, you can share your worries and everything else. And then, as you know, you've already said, people then will be like, oh, yeah, I'm the same. Or, oh, yeah, I had that last week. Or I went through this and I dealt with it this way. It's, I don't know how, how you do it because there is still that stigma around mental yeah. health. And I think that's the biggest concern. And well, I'd, I'd assume it would be one of the biggest concerns. It's, are we, are we there yet as, as a nation or how the hell can we get there quicker? You know, it's, it, <clears throat> do we just need to plaster over the billboards? It's okay to not be okay. You know, it's, I don't know. Um, I wish someone would come up with a, a great answer for it. Absolutely. I think one, one of the big the big things and the questions I get and the concerns I get actually when I'm, especially when I'm talking to HR, managers is um how do you get across that it's okay to not be okay and to speak up that you know perhaps you're struggling or you know you can't cope with this amount of work at the moment without opening the floodgates for everyone just to say i can't do the work and and that is a big big concern how do they stop people from swinging the lead how do you know to and i always say you know what that's a bigger conversation because that's about now about not trusting your employees mm -hmm. and that's a bigger conversation so for most people they, they won't say they're, they're, they're stressed and need to go off on stress leave, you know, if, if they're not. Just like most people wouldn't say they've got a migraine or a bad back when they haven't. So there's a, that's a bigger conversation for 99% for of, of the workforce. If they're feeling generally like they're stressed and they need to speak up, it's because they're genuinely, I've got stuff going on. Um, unfortunately, you're always going to get that, that small minority who you know, who push the boundaries. You, you are. And you let that in. Yeah, play the system in every walks of life and every single thing. But you can't play to them. You've got to play to the majority of people. So if someone comes to you and you create that environment where they say, you know, I'm, I'm really struggling because you know, I've got a breakdown at home or I've got this going on, I've got that going on, I've got an elderly parent that I'm having to care for. My head, I just cannot juggle everything going on for me and all this work. I need some support. For the organisation or the, the manager to realise this is a short-term issue and if you can support that person and help them understand what they can do to help build their mental fitness, so, you know, what, what even support them and talk to them about their, their personal life and what they're doing as well as supporting them in their um, working environment, then actually they're going to be back at work a lot quicker and being productive. The biggest problem we've got at the moment is productive um, is uh, presenteeism. So if you know that people aren't at work of absenteeism, it's costing organisations a lot of money. But you know the work isn't getting done, so you put plans in place. But if people are there and they're just not being productive, they're trying their best. They're not doing it because they want to be lazy. They're trying their best, but they're missing deadlines. They're missing opportunities. Uh, they're making mistakes and they are struggling and they're just keeping their head above water. Then that's costing organizations one and a half to two times more because it's going under the radar and it's now then affecting other people in the organization and causing issues, you know, across, across the different sort of teams and, 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 um, and the workforce. And so actually by just getting people at work, isn't good enough. It's getting people to be at work at their best, being able to contribute and, um, and be there and be productive. And that's, and it's really short-sighted if you're just looking at organisations saying, well, people are at work. Let's just get them at work. And because actually that, that's not, 
that's not going to be um, sustainable and it's not going to make the business run smoothly and successfully. Totally. And I think my mind then automatically goes to the whole point that as great as you know, mental health first aid courses are and how important they are and to have people trained, it's also leadership development as well, isn't it? And empowering leaders better. And it's that side of training as well as, as, well as you know, just focus courses. Yes, we need those people who can spot the triggers, who can be there and help. But it's that having an understanding. You know, maybe if we're going to move to this whole different world that you know, more people are working from home, you know, remote working is going to be it's one of the biggest growth sectors um, or you know, growth ways of working that's coming out of all this. But then realizing that people may have different hours now that work better for them. So let them work those hours, encourage it, because if they're working on their terms but still getting the job done. Surely that's a good thing. It's, it shouldn't be on a nine to five. Um, let's, let's move with the times and you know, people work in different ways. So encourage it and support it. But that's a whole total shift in the workplace, isn't it? And uh, it is. I don't think we're going to do that from one podcast, mate. Well, well no, but it, it is. It's interesting. So I was, um, I, was, I was reading an article the other day and I, forgive me, I can't remember which one it was now, but it was, it was about HR and, and the, the progress we have moved within um, flexi working and, and all that sort of stuff we've, we've moved probably within the last six months we would it would normally expect to take about 10 years okay. so the amount of people that have now said you know the onus is now more on the employer saying why you need to be in the office rather than it used to be why the employee used to say they'd be able to work from home it shifted across because we proved that people can work from home and not in all cases, of course, but in a lot of cases, people can work from home and can be very productive. Now, some people still hate it and want to be in the office. And of course we're all different. And, but actually, yeah, you're absolutely right. That flexi working because we, when we step in that office, we are still the same person as we were at home. We're still, you know, um, a carer. We're still a, a mom or a dad or a, an, an auntie, an uncle, a brother, a sister. We're still whoever we were before we stepped in the office and we can't, just switch it all off and be somebody else. We can't just suddenly have that, you know, put that professional hat on and forget everything else that's causing us turmoil and just be, you know, a different person. We need to be authentic. We need to be ourselves. And, and it's really important that actually if that means that we flex our hours but still get everything done, then surely that can only be a positive. Totally. And uh, it's... It- ties in perfectly to a book that I'm uh, listening to or you know, reading at the moment on Audible. And it's that whole thing that, yeah, there is this whole new idea, this new rich. And this book was, uh, I think it was 10 years ago or something, but it's so interesting that we were only just catching up to that. But yeah, it could be, could be amazing. It could be a real transformation. And, and if people can get that better balance into it as well, then it, it's got to be, got to be a good thing. And the, the most expensive thing that I think any employer would say is their workforce. So have a happier, healthier workforce that are going to be more productive. You're onto a win. It's, it's so blatantly obvious and so simple to, to realize, but it is just accepting that change and moving with the times. Lately. Yeah. So, that's it. <laughs> so let's, let's go on to what people can do. Because, I mean, obviously there's so many different services that you've got, you know, from your corporate training background and your accreditations um, we, you know, within mental health, especially. But what are great tips that the listener can take away and empower themselves to, to be better, um, whether it's better looking after themselves or being a better way of helping others as well? What, what are some great takeaways that the listener can take? Okay, so... Um so mental health first aid training is brilliant, you know, and it, and it doesn't give, like I say, it's not that magic bullet, but it certainly gives you a strategy um, and the confidence to be able to start the conversation with somebody and to know what to say and what, you know, not, not to say. So if you don't have mental health first aid in the workplace, that's certainly something to think about and to um, potentially address the um um, the MH of A England website is brilliant to, to have a, a look at. And that's the training courses that I run. I run the, the suite of adult courses, the two day, the one day and the half day awareness course. Um, but moving away from that and actually what your listeners can do today and actually make a difference, which I think is really important. 
And the big the big thing, and we talk about this on the course as well, is self care. And it's, it's starting with you. Um, so I would challenge your listeners to write down five things that make them smile. What makes them smile? What do they enjoy doing? Be it hobbies, be it, you know, whatever it might be, what do they enjoy doing? And then to look in their diaries and see where they are in their diaries. Have they actually diaried any of that, that, those th- items, those things in their diaries? And if they haven't, then to... Think about next week or the week after and start planning in when you're going to do them. It could be it could be a two minute walking around your garden looking at the amazing colours of the leaf, the leaf changes. It could be the dog walk that you love doing, but actually you've been so busy you only do the quick nip round the block rather than that beautiful walk across the field. And actually start diving in and planning when you're going to do these things. Because actually these are the most important things, not the rest of the stuff on your to-do list. That gets done because you're productive, because you've done the nice things, the things that make you smile, the things that are your coping strategies that reduce that stress, that make you have the ability to get all the mundane tasks done. It could be as simple as making sure you take a lunch break. My goodness, shock, horror. What's one of them? Take a lunch break, move away from your desk. Don't eat your sandwich at your desk. Move away, step outside. The environment is amazing. If you don't have a garden, stick your head out the window. Just get some light to you. Even even on dark, dull days, you get the, the effect that the sun has on you is incredible. So just get some sunlight, get outside as much as you can. Um, But yeah, really focus on your self-care and start to really challenge yourself on, are you fitting it in or are you making it a priority? Um, So that's the the first thing to really start. And then you can make it habitual Um, and challenge each other on it as well. Tell other people what you're doing so they can they can make you accountable. Are you taking that break? Are you walking around the block? Are you doing this? What are you starting to go playing your guitar again? Because you love doing it. Are you listening to the music you love listening to? Whatever it might be for you. And then the next thing, and this is a biggie, is not giving advice. So if somebody says something to you, you know, I'm really struggling. What do you think I ought to do? Don't give them advice. Just ask them about why, what they're feeling. Because actually, by giving them that space just to talk to you, they often come up with the answers themselves. And we're not medical professionals. So if you're not a medical professional, don't start giving advice. Because Just because something worked really well for your cousin or your best friend or your mom doesn't mean it's necessarily going to work for that person. And if you start giving advice and they decide not to follow it because they don't feel they can, they may struggle to come back to you because they may worry that you're going to then judge them for not taking your advice. So really, please stop giving advice, even though it's what we we, we jump to because we want to help. It comes from a good place, but it often isn't as helpful as we think it might be. Rather than advice, sit back and listen and be that absorption point for for those problems. And yeah, just just be there. Just be, be present. You know, be an active listener. Try and... Be a good listener, essentially, so that you're actually taking things in. You're not just straight away being like, oh, you should do this. It's, yeah, I love that. That's, that's powerful. Yeah, it is. I think if you, if you just flick it to physical health again, and if somebody dislocated their shoulder, you wouldn't run over to them and suddenly tell them to suddenly swing their arm around to pop it back in. Or you wouldn't walk up to somebody and just bang it back in yourself. You wouldn't do that. You wouldn't dream of just solving the problem. You would perhaps sit them down, ask them if they're okay, get them some water, get them a sling to something to support their arm, or and then you'd get professional help. Whereas with mental health, we, we tend to think we seem to think we've got to solve the problem straight away, and it's not about that. That support we can give can just be sitting with somebody, and that can be the most powerful thing we can do. Totally, and you know, I'd like to you know, say to to anyone who who knows me the door is always open for me to listen. There's no problem whatsoever because we all need someone at some point. And yeah, whether it's business, whether it's personal, whatever, pick up the damn phone, you know, it's, um, have your, have your network around you, you know, it's, it's important to, to have that both home and work and know that you've, you've got that. And yeah, let's hope that this whole new vocab that we're developing can 
be embedded into our lives, our work lives, and really help help make it a, a better place for everyone. And you know, we can all take 2020 as a positive year rather than the kick in the guts that it's felt like at times. Absolutely. So if people, if the listeners want to find out more about you and why you're this expert um, talking about all this, where can they find you and, and what sort of services can you offer? Um, so, yeah, so my company is Beacon Learning and Performance. Um, so, yeah, so obviously I've got my website so people can find me on my website, www.beaconlearningandperformance.co.uk. Um, uh, uh, and I'm also, I'm also um, on LinkedIn um, as well. Don't ask me what my handle is because I've forgotten. That's fine. Um, <laughs> we'll put it in the notes, mate. It's all good. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, so, um, but yeah, so I... I I offer, um, I do mental health training. I do mental health first aid um, training for um, large organizations. I do in-house training. So I could come in and do, um, do run courses. Um, but for smaller businesses and individuals, I run open courses as well. And, and at the moment, um, they're virtual. So I run virtual courses that take two days um, and you can become a mental health first aider. And a lot of people actually have come on my open courses. They've, they've done it themselves. They've decided off their own back. They want to learn more of how to support themselves, friends, family, as well as colleagues. And it, it, it's, 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 it's really interesting. And a lot of the people that come on my courses actually are recommendations from other people that have been on them, which is really lovely. Um, I also run bespoke webinars for, for um, organizations and, and, you know, for um, corporate meetings around getting people to understand, you know, some of the terms that we've talked about now um, and challenging people on what they think is mental health and, and what do they do currently. Um, so, so yes, yeah, so there's, there's, there's all, you know, a host of different things that, that, um, that I do. Um, and my why, my biggest why and why I do this, um, you know, my background is, is training. I've, I've been um, a sales management trainer, for over 10 years in the, in the pharmaceutical industry. And I started my own business um, after redundancy. Um, and the reason I focus on mental health training now is because I was quite poorly myself about 15 years ago with my own mental health, um, with anxiety and depression. Um, and the trigger for me was my father-in-law became very ill and sadly passed away relatively quickly. And I was trying to I was trying to suppress all my feelings because I felt like I had to be the one that looked after everybody else. It wasn't my dad. So I had to be the one then that picked up the pieces for the, for the family around me, like my husband and, and his family. Um, but you can't, you can't suppress these feelings. You can't stop how you feel. Um, and, it, and it came out eventually. Um, and I fortunately got the support I needed relatively quickly. Um, and I've always talked to people about my story when I can see someone is overwhelmed. So I'm coming from a place of no judgment and people then open up and start talking to me, which is so important. Uh, and then I discovered MHFA England and realized actually I wanted to train and become a trainer for mental health first aid to really have a much better platform to support people. Um, and that's really why I do what I do. So I, I bring my lived experience and I bring my training and facilitation background together um, to be able to train people in a way that's authentic, in a way that um, it's, it's fun. Actually, we talk about some quite heavy, heavy stuff. Um, but actually, everyone, you know, the, the feedback that I get is that it, it, it can, you know, people learn, um, have a bit of a laugh on the way, um, and they take so much from it. Um, and I love, absolutely love what I do. Mate, that's, that's brilliant. And I love the fact that you turned what was a massive negative into the biggest positive, both for yourself personally, but then also how you're now using that skill set to help others um and be that transformation so yeah that's i think that's just awesome and it's it's inspiring to show that you know what we we can all do better um so let's let's do what we can whether it's taking you know 10 minutes to, to have a look at you know, the mhfa uh, website or you know whatever it's do something um do something be better be that listener and help be that transformational force 
Fantastic. Absolutely. Amanda, thank you so much for coming on, mate. It's been an absolute pleasure to, to chat about this. And I know we could talk forever on different strategies and different things people can do, but I think you've given a couple of really, really solid insights there as to things people can do straight away now. Um, one of the biggest ones I'm taking away is to be a, a better listener than a talker, but it's, um, you know, that's, there's so much there. So thank you so much. And I'll say we'll put all your details in the show notes, especially your LinkedIn profile, because you couldn't remember what it was. Um, <laughs> so that, uh, the listeners can find you and, and get in touch and start that conversation for themselves and, and see how you can help them or their workplace. That's amazing. No, thank you very much. I've thoroughly enjoyed it. Thank you. Wow. What an episode that was. Amanda, I feel empowered, enlightened and invigorated to firstly learn more about mental health but to to be better and to help more and i know the listeners will have so many takeaways that they can leave listening this with everything from being authentic you know not suppressing things talk be open identify what your triggers are and just find ways to deal with them and let's hope that we do as a nation as a population develop these new vocab and you know these new skill sets that we are open more and we are happy in communicating about this better and don't forget take away that self-care whether it's that you know, writing down those five things i'm already on it or to putting in them in your diary it's certainly something I'm going to be doing. It's something I've been meaning to do for far too long. And uh, yeah, you will definitely improve my personal life for doing that. So thank you. And listeners, if you do want to know more about how Amanda can help you or your workplace or whatever, get in touch. All the details are in the show notes, but I can promise from seeing the whites of her eyes as we were talking, the passion is huge. So please get in touch. I know that she'll be transformational for you and your business. Mental health awareness is such an important topic and we are literally just scratching the surface with these couple of episodes, but I just want to get the conversation going. So let's get it out there. It's okay to not be okay. It's okay to ask for help. It's okay that things aren't perfect, but it's how we deal with them that matters. Don't give advice but let's make our culture shift into a way of understanding. It's okay when things aren't perfect. It's how we deal with them and how we support that matters. We are one person. We are we one need to look after ourselves and we need to look after those around us. We've only got one chance at this life sort of thing. So let's make it count. Let's look after ourselves the way that we'd look after anything else. And employers listening, look after your staff. They're probably your most expensive resource and the right investment in communication and education could make one hell of a difference. And let's see where this the new workplace ends up taking us as we move through the final quarter of 2020 into 21. I'm Stuart James. This is The Personal Connection. I'm from Emotivoy, where you got one chance to connect. Make it count.